Hello, Chloe. Hello, Ida. So earlier today, I was having a conversation with Chloe about the comics code, and I would like to make a video going into a little bit more detail as to what the hell that is. And I'm going to click off on OBS to make sure. Yeah. Um, and, and to illustrate some points about the comics code, I have with me here Love is Love, which, as I have mentioned to both of you before, Love is Love is an anthology of uh, short graphic stories, usually one pages, uh, sometimes like two or four, but it was compiled in the wake of the uh, Orlando Pulse nightclub shooting, and um, it is basically a bunch, like not even all like queer comic uh, writers and artists, but just like all sorts of comic writers and artists uh, writing stories that uh, reflect some positivity towards the LGBTQIA plus community, particularly of Orlando, Florida. And yeah, so a lot of these characters feature uh, homosexual characters and themes of like loss and shit. A lot of stories of like parents trying to explain to their kids what exactly hate is and shit. A lot of them are very, very good. And it's an interesting graphic novel for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is because Despite its positive nature and uh, benefit to the community, because the money earned from it did go to some good causes as well, the comic book itself, under the Comics Code Authority's uh, Comics Code laws, or rules I guess I should say, would actually not be allowed. It's nothing but positive, but it wouldn't be allowed under the Comics Code Authority, because the Comics Code Authority is an inter interesting... Um, artifact of like a bygone era of, of censorship and attitudes of the American people and particularly the government uh, towards like the the way people express themselves um, things have gotten better since the comics code uh, shut down and like stopped like mattering at all but uh, it, it's worth examining this history lesson to fully understand how censorship and these attitudes shaped what is currently known as like comics media and stuff because the thing is is that the comics code started in uh the 1950s i believe in 1954 yeah so in the 50s a book was published called seduction of the innocent a scholarly study which it said that it demonstrated an influential connection between troubled children and the comics they read but it was found out later that the data was completely distorted and cherry-picked and sometimes just completely fabricated. So it was built on it was some outrage built on some bullshit, but it led to some public calls of censorship of comic books as comics were considered to be a medium largely geared towards children. It's my phone ringing. Yes, it is. Hello, Chloe. It was convincing enough that people ended up pushing for restrictions on uh, comic books and what was published in them. So in 1954, uh, the comic book industry formed the Comic Magazine Association of America, or the CMAA. It was led by Archie Comics and DC Comics, which keep in mind Archie Comics and DC Comics because their attitudes, like what they all publish and their business strategies, and uh, their opinions of the comics code are going to matter as like the story I'm telling you develops. First, we're going to have to understand, in order to understand the narrative going forward, <clears throat> we're going to have to understand what exactly the comics code prohibited, because this really says it all in terms of what the times were like. The code was established in 1954, uh, uh, and it goes thusly. Number one, Crimes shall never be presented in such a way as to create sympathy for the criminal, to promote distrust of the forces of law and justice, or to inspire others with a desire to imitate criminals. Immediately we see something weird because we're deciding, all right, criminals are not people to be sympathized with, no matter what their situations are. And uh, like forces of law and justice are not to be distrusted, no matter what their situations are. And the inspire others with a desire to imitate criminal criminals that's a highly subjective thing this means that you're not allowed to make criminals look cool or law enforcement people look like idiots like so if you're trying to tell a story with those elements that those elements are critical to the story that story is just disallowed by like law or not like law but rules the fun the exact functions of the comics code aren't so cut and dry as 
if the comics code disallows it, you're disallowed to publish it. But they are effectively, if the comics code disallows it, you're not allowed, you're never going to get it distributed. So, number two. If crime is depicted, it shall be as a sordid and unpleasant activity. This is a weird one, and it's kind of hard to interpret the deeper, like, effects of it. But this means that, like, crime is never meant to be, like, depicted as a good thing or a thing that people are in agreement with. But also not as, like we said before, a sympathetic thing where people are doing it because they have to. Which means that criminals are kind of only allowed to be, like, incompetent, sad, but also, like, greedy. So they're all around designed, uh, forced to be designed, like, stupidly. They have to be bad and dumb. This resulted in certain villains not getting reused a lot in the 50s and uh, sometimes in the 60s because they would always risk accidentally telling a sympathetic story about why this criminal keeps going back to bad behavior. Number three, criminals shall not be presented so as to be rendered glamorous or to occupy a position which creates a desire for emulation. This is a, ties very much into the first two, but it, it's more driving home the point of don't make being a criminal look attractive. Don't even make the criminal attractive incidentally to their crime. It's not allowed to be an attractive person doing the crime, even if the crime has nothing to do with their attractiveness. Number four, in every instance good shall triumph over evil and the criminal shall be punished for his misdeeds. So, you know, this is very straightforward. Good has to win, bad guys have to lose. This has an awkward and hilarious side effect of mandating that there be good guys and bad guys, however. Number five, scenes of excessive violence shall be prohibited. Scenes of brutal torture, excessive and unnecessary knife and gunplay, physical agony, gory and gruesome crime shall be eliminated. So this kind of makes sense in terms of like regulating what goes on in the children's media, right? But comics were only made children's media by the people who were making these rules. They weren't made children's media children's media by the people who were making the comics themselves or buying the comics. So no knives, no guns, no blood, barely any violence. Although violence was allowed, it just wasn't allowed to be like in a completely arbitrary degree of like violent, you know? Um, this had an interesting effect in that if you look at the superheroes who debuted in like the 1960s, you have people like Hawkeye Spider-Man, Thor, Doctor Strange, Iron Man, who, like, oh, or, like, the fucking X-Men, not specifically using guns. Like, Cyclops's optic blasts, they're not guns, and Doctor Strange's, like, magic, even if it makes people explode, isn't a gun. And it, it kind of resulted in some creative ideas being fielded, but, you know, it's fucking censorship. I'm not gonna, like, credit censorship for other people's creativity. Number six, no comic magazine shall use the word horror and terror and or terror in its title. If this rule seems excessively petty, that's because remember how I said that Archie Comics and DC Comics were leading the CMAA? Um, the Tales from the Crypt series by EC Comic would oftentimes use horror in the title of its stories, you know, like Tales of Horror. Uh, kind of kind of anthologies meaning that dc comics and archie comics could essentially regulate away the primary method of marketing a certain genre of comics number seven i think all scenes of horror excessive bloodshed gory or gruesome crimes depravity lust sadism and masochism shall not be per permitted so uh if this seems a bit redundant of the previous one that is a, a good point but, um, including depravity, lust, sadism, masochism, it means that not only are, uh, like, brutal acts of violence disallowed, but sex crimes and, uh, like, cruelty of any form, like, uh, non-murderous cruelty weren't allowed. It kind of limited what the motivations and goals of a villain is, because if a villain isn't allowed to be competent, uh, persistently successful, like motivated by lust or like sadism but they're also not allowed to be sympathetic it like the the definition of what a villain is allowed to be keeps getting narrower and narrower number eight i think all lurid unsavory and uh gruesome illustrations shall be eliminated uh it's just like a stylistic law 
Because, keep in mind, gruesome is the only word in that, like, description that actually relates to whether or not something is, like, violent or not. Lurid and unsavory, if the rule was just lurid and unsavory illustrations shall be eliminated, well, lurid and unsavory could mean that you dislike, um, I don't know, this color of a person's skin. It can also mean, like, disliking certain aesthetics, like ray gun sci-fi or something like that. But number nine or whatever, inclusion of stories dealing with evil shall uh, be used or shall be published only where the intent is to illustrate a moral issue. In no case shall evil be presented alluringly, nor so as to injure the sensibilities of the reader. All right, this is a very wordy way of saying that if you're going to write about evil, you're going to write about how something is evil. And remember, you're not allowed to talk about how untrustworthy the authority is, and so... You're really only allowed to talk about what the Comics Code Authority thinks is evil as evil. Number 10, scenes dealing with or instruments associated with walking dead, torture, vampires, and vampirism, ghouls, cannibalism, and werewolfism are prohibited. So basically you're not allowed to run classic mo uh, gothic horror monster stories. This is a weirdly refined rule. It kind of, because like gothic horror tends to have some sympathy for the monsters. Like vampires are hungry, werewolves are angry, Frankenstein is like, has trouble connecting with people. You know, it's like gothic horror creatures are usually tragic in some way. And so they naturally evoke sympathy. And so this rule seems to indicate that the writers of the rules were aware of this and they didn't want any of that sick sympathetic filth. Number 11, profanity, obscenity, smut, vulgarity, or words or symbols which have acquired undesirable meanings are forbidden. Right, so uh, not allowed to have um, bad words. Uh, all, right, all right, actually, actually, here is what is disallowed by this rule, profanity words that the Comics Code Authority doesn't like. Obscenity, statements or interjections that the Comics Code Authority doesn't like. Smut, depictions of things happening between people that the Comics Code Authority doesn't like. Vulgarity, or words or symbols that ha which have acquired undesirable meanings. Images that the Comics Code Authority doesn't like. So, just so we're clear, this means that if they didn't like Coca-Cola, and they thought that Coca-Cola was associated with, like, childhood obesity or something, and they could say, no more Coca-Cola symbols in comics. That's what they could do. That's, that's their prerogative. They can decide that. Number 12. Nudity in any form is prohibited, as is indecent or undue exposure. Number 13. Suggestive and salacious illustration or suggestive posture is unacceptable. Number 14. Females shall be drawn realistically without exaggeration of any physical qualities. So I want to put these three together because really what they're talking about is that they're not saying that women are not allowed to be objectified. Certainly not. They are not coming to the defense of women in that sense. They are saying that women are not allowed to be sexual. And that sort of limitation is just, you know, comically dated now. Those three rules uh, are interesting to view in light of the next one, which is illicit sex relations are neither to be hinted at nor portrayed. Violent love scenes as well as sexual abnormalities are unacceptable. Did you catch it? I mean, everybody in the 50s and 60s and 70s caught it, but did you catch it? Because when they say illicit sex relations and sexual abnormalities, guess what they're talking about? Guess. Guess. Fucking guess. Yeah, so these were the rules as they were set out in the 1950s. Now, I brought up earlier when we were talking about their rule about guns, like how Spider-Man and Doctor Strange and all these characters came out of the 1960s. Let's go back to that, shall we? Because uh, Zatanna, Daredevil, Animal Man, Black Panther, like uh, Carol Danvers, all these characters came out in the 60s. All of these, like remarkably well-known, like Captain America was resurrected in the 60s. All these remarkably well-known characters were founded and shaped in this time when like the government was saying, you gotta regulate, like comics have to be regulated. And this shows, especially with Superman, which is something that, uh, this is why this got brought up between Chloe and myself, is that uh, 
Superman only being allowed to solve problems, like, so, uh, solve the problems of, like, people trying to take over the world, he could only have, like, black and white morality stories. Like, of course it was going to devolve him into, like, you know, super puncher person 9000. Of course it was going to make him boring. It couldn't do any, it, it couldn't do anything but make him boring. All the comics from this era were boring, because none of them were allowed to do anything other than, like, essentially the same thing over and over again. Archie Comics, DC Comics, and Marvel Comics were the ones that could profit off of this, but not everybody could. EC Comics ended up having to close its doors after trying to reprint a comic called Judgment Day, which featured a black main character. If you're wondering, what fucking Comics Code Authority of Rule disallows a black main character? Actually, none. But the Comics Code Authority said they weren't allowed to publish it anyways, despite it conforming to all the other rules. They ended up having to go to court and fight a legal battle for years, at the end of which they had to close their doors even though they won. Even when the Comics Code Authority was conformed to, it was used as like a cudgel to beat people into line, into submission with the party line, the social norms, what was acceptable back then. Eventually the Comics Code Authority started uh, to lose its authority. Um, reading from the TV Tropes article on the Comics Code, the first serious challenge to the code's effectiveness came in 1971, when Marvel Comics scribe Stan Lee wrote Green Goblin Reborn, a Spider-Man story that not only portrayed drugs in an extremely negative light, but had been written on the explicit recommendation of the United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. All of that made the CCA look damned foolish when it re refused to approve the story because it showed a character using drugs. Since Marvel had earned the clout to defy the CCA, it removed the code seal from the comics containing the storyline, which appeared in Amazing Spider-Man number 96 through 98. The story received considerable public appreci appreciation and a critical acclaim. The CCA found out just how far it had fallen out of touch with the industry and society in general. This uh, led to a 1971 revision of the Comics Code Authority's rules. However, it actually wasn't until fucking 1989, 35 years after the CMAA was founded and the Comics Code Authority uh, set in place, 35 years before homosexuality was allowed under these rules, all right? Like, I threw love is love too far away for me to pick it up and show it to you again. However, things have gotten better, tremendously better. As of 2011, nobody is following the Comics Code Authority. In fact, D uh, in January 2011, DC fully abandoned the code in favor of an in-house rating system. Archie Comics, the code's sole remaining participant and administrator, figured the code no longer served a purpose in light of the company's publishing standards. So it abandoned the code just a day after DC. That move ended the comics code once or for all, and almost immediately thereafter, Archie debuted Afterlife with Archie, the company's first direct market title. Afterlife featured a full-on zombie apocalypse, something the code had been created to prevent. Even worse for the code, the first issue of Afterlife sold out twice. On September 29th, 2011, the Comics Code uh, uh, announced it had sold the intellectual property rights of the Code Seal to the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, a U.S.-based nonprofit organization that helps to protect First Amendment rights of comic publishers, creators, and retailers by covering legal expenses. Yeah, so the Comics Code Authority and the Comics Code that it ruled by died a pitiful death uh, seven years ago. Yeah, this shit went on for too long. Things have gotten better. Things had been getting better since day one. But it, it, it's always good to look back on this history. One, to understand how bad things used to be. And two, to understand how good things are now. I have never lived in a time where the Comics Code Authority had any actual authority. I'm very thankful for that. Looking back, however, and thinking about how bad things were, it's important to remember that... The Comics Code Authority was not the, like, tool of the tyrannical white man. The point that the Comics Code illustrates is not that the white man is more tyrannical than all the other types of man out there, and that's why he makes rules like this. These rules do not come exclusively from one, from one race, one sex, or one sexuality. These rules are used opportunistically by people who want to impress their will on other people. And that stuff is completely gender, race, and sexuality neutral. These rules only exist as long as people are willing to submit and conform to tyranny. If it becomes more socially acceptable to write only stories about black homosexuals, then 
yeah, people are going to try and make rules that mandate that you only write that kind of story because there will always exist people who are trying to do that. However, we know from experience, from watching this history play out, that those people are wrong. Anybody upping any race over any other race is wrong and that they are almost bound to fail by the inadequacies that those very rules necessitate. Things have gotten better and they will continue to get better. And if things ever fall back into uh, this sort of pattern, they'll swiftly right themselves, I am confident. I hope everybody enjoyed this brief history lesson. If you have any question, uh, questions about the Comics Code and the Comics Code Authority, I'd be thrilled to answer them below. I will link the TV Tropes article that I pulled most of this information from. There's a lot more to it. Uh, there's new rules in 1971 and 1989 that I didn't read, and an even deeper history of what went on there. So I recommend reading that. Um, uh, thank you all for listening, and I'll see you all next time.